Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good, <clears throat> good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Do we have an exciting program today or what? The new future is going to unfold before your eyes in the form of Josh Powell, CEO of Revolution, one of Hawaii's larger or maybe largest solar companies. We like to think so. Yeah. And disclaimer, disclaimer, we are featuring one company today, but this in no way implies that the State Energy Office or Think Tech Hawaii endorses this particular company. Their, Hawaii is one of the nation's leaders in solar energy, and there are a lot of perfectly good companies out there in addition to Josh Powell's company. So welcome to the program, Josh. Thank thanks, you so thanks, much Howard. for being here. So the program, or the title of our program is Batteries Are the Future. And you say, now wait a minute, I thought we were talking about solar as in photovoltaics. So Josh, why are batteries the future of solar energy? So, you know, one of the anecdotes <clears throat> I like to repeat when I'm talking to uh, new customers about storage uh, and about batteries in their homes is, you know, 10 years ago when we started the business, I remember sort of talking to customers about having an appliance in their garage someday that would, mm -hmm. uh, would store enough energy for a day or two and, and enable them to have other things that you didn't get with a traditional grid-tied PV mm -hmm. system like resilience, uh, maybe more control over energy, um, additional capacity, um, lots of, of, of other things that, that a grid-tied battery without storage doesn't, doesn't do. Now, now grid-tied means on your roof, your photovoltaic system is creating electricity, and that's going directly into Hawaiian right. Electric's grid. So all the solar that everybody got used to over the mm -hmm. last decade, uh, most of the you know, net metered systems, things like that, don't have any storage, and they... they they backfeed electricity into the grid, or you know you use it when you're consuming energy directly. But if you're not consuming it at the time and it's still producing, then it just goes back to the grid, and mm -hmm. either your neighbors use it or somebody else uses it. And the battery allows you, as a consumer, to have much more direct control over what's happening mm -hmm. and to choose how you use it. And that really changes the whole game mm -hmm. for everybody. So why don't you, can you walk us through kind of a brief history of yeah. photovoltaics in Hawaii? And I emphasize again, per capita, we are probably the nation's leader in this field. I, we're, I think you'd be real safe saying that. We're absolutely yeah. the leader per mm -hmm. capita. We're one of the, the most PV dense areas in the world. Um, and in battery storage, we're absolutely the leader in the nation right mm -hmm. now. Um, but, but yeah, going back to say like 2007, 2008, uh, when the market started to, to gain some steam, um, we first had changes in incentives or risk of changes in incentives. Mm -hmm. The risk actually mm -hmm. didn't materialize in 2008. Incentives got in extended. Um, and so in 2009, 2010, you started to see the, the residential PV market really gain some steam. And usually we find that residential sort of leads commercial a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, consumers are more confident, or, or maybe they experiment more with their homes first, the early mm -hmm. adopters. So we started to see us, the market go from hundreds a year to literally thousands a mm -hmm. year. Uh, and in the period of, of 20, uh, you know, 2011 to 2013, we started seeing crazy, you know, huge numbers, like 10,000, 15,000 mm -hmm. systems a year mm -hmm. on Oahu, um, on a grid where there's only 150,000 single-family homes. So uh, you, you, can, you can see how you know, that starts to change the dynamic of who's producing energy relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we started to obviously have an impact on, on how the grid was, was functioning to some degree. And I think uh, you know, more directly, uh, you had enough people generating energy that you mm -hmm. also started to erode uh, generation revenue for the utility, mm -hmm. um, which sort of woke up 
uh, the, the utility from a policy perspective and, and in the 20, 2012 to 2013 timeframe started to work to change some of the rules to slow things down mm -hmm. a little bit. N namely to discontinue uh, net energy metering. Yeah, and yeah. it started, mm -hmm. you know, we really, you know, nobody, I think, anticipated how fast solar would grow. Yeah. Maybe not even us. I mean, well, we, there, there was a little thing called, was a 30% state tax credit and 35% yeah. federal or, or reverse that. You know, the, the yeah. credits are powerful in mm -hmm. Hawaii, um, but I think the single biggest factor in, in the, you know, 2008 to, to 2013 period was the price of oil. Mm -hmm. So all of our energy in Hawaii was essentially being produced by oil then. It was 95% in 2008. It's about 80% today. And, and, you know, when oil went to $100 a barrel mm -hmm. and $150 a barrel, energy prices, you know, we were paying retail rates 35 cents a kilowatt yeah. hour. And, and that was on, on this, this island. Yeah. And the neighbor islands were even more expensive. So, so when you think about that, yeah. that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's three or four times what you might pay for the same energy on the mainland. Yeah, the typical and, mainland cost is 11 to 12 yeah. cents. Yeah. And, and so three, three X, maybe four X on the neighbor mm -hmm. islands. So there's not very many things in Hawaii you pay, yeah. th you know, we pay more for most things, mm -hmm. but we don't usually pay three or four times as yeah. much. Yeah. And yeah. so when consumers realized they could do things that would drop that cost dramatically, usually by half, then they moved really quickly, mm -hmm. and and it's easy to scale with residential. So, as that started to happen, uh, obviously, Pico focused on changing some rules with the PUC, and and we started seeing those rule changes in 2013. At first, by changing the the, the rules so that you had to wait longer to get a system, mm -hmm. sometimes eight eight to 12 months, maybe longer. Um, that slowed things down quite a bit in 2014. And then ultimately net metering went away. We were the first state to, to, to stop net metering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that sort of brought on this new market that we're, gonna, that we're talking about yeah. today. And if I can, from an amateur standpoint, explain what Hawaiian Electric's concern was, there in the middle of a sunny day, there was so much electricity produced yep. by photovoltaics that they can back off their generating plants only so much. It's like a you slow down a car's idle too much and it's going to die. They were backing off the power plants as much as they could and there was still too much electricity in the middle of the day. Is that a good summary? Of, yeah, I mean, yeah. when you think about it, our, let's, our, the grid on Oahu is uh, uh, 1.2 gigawatts, roughly. Mm -hmm. and, and so you have to, as a utility, you have, to gener you have to build capacity to support whatever the maximum of that grid mm -hmm. is. And, and some of it you have to keep running all the time, whether yeah. you're using it or not. And fossil fuel generation doesn't ramp up and down very quickly. Mm -hmm, Some forms mm -hmm. can ramp faster than others, but for instance, coal, uh, the heavy diesel plants, the, the, mm -hmm. those are not particularly fast. And, and so, yeah, it, it presents a problem. Um, you know, the, the electrical energy we're getting from the sun, you know, these are uh, uh, photons converting into electrons and creating current, it's moving at the speed of light. It's only limited by mm -hmm. how fast it can move through wires, and that maybe takes it to a third of the speed of light, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, many, many, many orders of magnitude faster yeah. than, than what you can do with a, a fossil fuel yeah. generated energy. Especially considering the fact that there's something up there called clouds. Yeah. And yeah. you get a great big cloud coming over, big sunny. Your PV capacity goes down, 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 down. Yep. Now Hawaiian Electric has to yep. respond. Can ramp, just like yeah, that. Can, yeah. can absolutely yeah, yeah. ramp up and down quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So, so that's the problem from Hawaiian Electric's standpoint. Yes. Yeah, as, as yeah. a as a mm -hmm. utility, it pre presents a conundrum. How are you going to support the grid? You've got all these, you know, at some at one level, this isn't often acknowledged, but you know, there's also a bunch of free energy that often isn't even being consumed by the mm -hmm, people creating mm -hmm. it. Uh, so there can be some net benefits, um, but those benefits can't really be realized unless you can put that energy somewhere yeah. in some form of storage. Um, you know, and there's lots of ways, lots of creative ideas on how to do that. Um, but what's happened now in just the last few years is the, the availability and cost of, of lithium storage, uh, 
So battery-based storage has come down dramatically, mm -hmm. and that's really mm -hmm. started to change things. Yeah. So why don't we go into a, the duck curb? Is this yeah. a good time to, uh, yeah, yeah, if we could a bring up a, a duck curb uh, slide here and examine it for a while. Okay, what in the world is going on with all these jiggly lines here now? So, so this is a, a great slide that actually was, I think, originally authored by uh, HECO. This is a HECO slide, and uh, um, it illustrates what it's called the duck curve now. When it was originally presented, they uh, characterized it as the Nessie uh, curve because it looks a little bit like uh, the Loch Ness monster, and maybe maybe there was some desire to get a, mm -hmm. get a bit of a monster in it. But basically, that big gray curve is people coming home, turning on air conditioners, televisions, cooking, and you see that the, the needed generation goes up dramatically in the evening. Why don't, why don't you walk us through the whole slide starting with the left uh, side there? Yeah, so you, you know, early in the morning, the least amount of energy consumption. Uh, you see that yellow curve is sort of solar energy, a tr typical uh, well, that's actually, sorry, that's commercial load profile. They don't have a, a solar overlay, but if you were to look at a solar overlay, you would imagine almost a bigger peak over that, over that yellow curve. But in that yellow zone that's highlighted in the center, that's your primary production. And you see that your primary consumption during that period is commercial energy users. Residential load profiles go at their lowest during the middle of the day. So if you think about a residential net metered PV system, that works great. You produce energy and then use it at night and you get full credit for it. But the argument from the utilities perspective and what's shown here is that because it's decreasing in the middle of the, of the day in terms of demand and you're producing all your energy then, it, they have to solve that other problem which is the demand increase that's, that comes later. And now, again, that, that's on the right side. Right. And you're seeing that stark rise <clears throat> in consumption because number one, everybody's coming home from school and work, turning on the TV, turning on the hot right. water, the stove, the oven. And this being a tourist economy, all the tourists are coming home from the yep. beach or from shopping. Eating dinner, and the going hotel the rooms are going mad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then they're going to the restaurants. There's, so, there's no yeah. question that it's, yeah. it's a real thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we would, we would argue that there's lots of ways to deal with it. You can, you can, uh, use some load controls, you mm -hmm. can you create some adaptations. But I think, you know, in general, um, people don't like to be told to change their behavior. Yep, yep. Um, so if there's another way you can help with that, um, I, I think that's probably, you know, becomes the most acceptable thing. And, yeah. and, you know, we're kind of lucky. These storage technologies have been around for you know, lithium ion technology is over 30 years old. It's been around for a long time. We've been using it in our laptops and our power tools for quite a while. Um, but it's right. been moving, mm -hmm. moving to, it, lots of improvements have been coming in, including yeah. electric vehicles. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's really changed uh, the pricing structure and made it more accessible. Yeah, yeah something called uh, mass production and Absolutely. improvements in technology yeah. all the time. But before we go any further on this, we need to take a brief break. Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii Code Green with Josh Powell, Powell, Powell uh, CEO of Revolution, back in a minute. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of ThinkTech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on ThinkTech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha.
Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Code Green, with Josh Powell, CEO of Revolution, and we're talking about the Loch Ness Monster and ducks, and the explanation of the duck curve from an electrical uh, demand standpoint, and what in the world we're going to do with storage. So can we bring the, uh, the, that other slide up, please? Slide two. Yeah, there we go. Now, what in the world's going on with this orange circle here, Josh? So, so I like the color orange, so mm -hmm. I put a big, big orange marker on there. But basically, I'm trying to, to carve out what I see as, as an opportunity instead of a, a challenge. And, and utilities generally present this as a big challenge, and you know, they use it initially as a, a way to fight uh, additional PV integration and additional uh, non-utility controlled renewable energy resources. Um, and, and when you think about that excess demand there that's sort of above the, the, the sort of normal consumption we see in the other parts of the day, um, you know, once you have digital control over energy in time, and that's what a battery does for you, um, you can shift that. So you can produce it a few hours before you need it and then use it, or with a lithium ion battery, you could produce it almost a year before you need it mm -hmm. and then use it. So we, when you think about our electrical grid, we've never ever had that. In the, yeah. in the 120 odd years mm -hmm. that we've been playing with electricity, we've never been able to move energy around that way other than in a barrel of oil. Yeah, yeah. And it takes a long time to convert a barrel of oil into electrons, mm -hmm. whereas a battery, light speed, instantaneous. And again, we're storing that energy in the middle of the day when there's actually too much yep. electricity being produced by, by the Instead PVs. of it going to the grid and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, being redistributed or maybe lost, line loss, things like that, you're storing it right there mm -hmm. at relatively high efficiency. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about 5 to 10 percent loss in the storage, mm -hmm. whereas you might have 30 or 40 percent line loss in distribution. Now that five to ten percent loss, <clears throat> we we grew up with lead acid batteries, and I believe that their loss was a lot higher than that. You're stretching me. Stretching, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I try not to pay too much attention mm -hmm. to the lead. I mean, it's certainly been around, and it's been yeah. a staple of the the, the PV industry, mm -hmm. particularly off grid for a long time. Lead acid's a good example of a, uh, a you know technology that's been around since almost the beginning of electricity. Mm -hmm. Um, and not really a, a tremendous amount of improvement. Um, but I think it's actually, you make it, you know, you, you sort of segue into another important point. Lead has sort of been the, uh, let's say, it, that, that's the baseline cost-effective battery out there. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happened in the last uh, three years is lithium ion has come down, in the last five years, it's come down 70% in cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, it really wasn't obtainable at the kind of scale you'd need for electric vehicles and homes until just the last few years. Mm -hmm. And but it's 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 now happening pretty rapidly. And like you pointed out earlier, that's really just a factor of scale. Once there's demand in the marketplace and we start to scale these products, then we start to generate more manufacturing efficiencies, mm -hmm. and those efficiencies lead to cost reductions, just like. You know, I think you and I can both remember maybe the Commodore 64, some some early uh, computing technologies, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, think about the memory we have in our our cell phones now. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, or even the memory in certain watches. I think yeah. you know more more powerful than probably all the computers that mm -hmm. that existed in 1980, uh, you know, 87. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, we see the same thing mm -hmm. happening with storage technology. So. It really puts consumers in a in a great position where these products are scalable and accessible and affordable, and now you get a choice. Like, what do you mm -hmm. want to do with your energy? You can produce it, you can store it. That opens up new new options for how you might utilize it, whether it's safety, security, mm -hmm. resilience. Mm -hmm. I think for Hawaii, we don't talk much right now about resilience, but when we look at these hurricanes, Michael, yeah, Puerto no. Rico. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be speaking at a resilience yeah. conference tomorrow. That's a hu another huge benefit of these systems, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and and that you know there's other things they can do uh, in the grid. 
um, to support the utility, mm -hmm. to actually make it easier to, to deal with other forms of generation yeah. that are already on the grid. Ab absolutely, and uh, one really good example of what you're talking about was the fact that early in, <clears throat> in the PV game, the electricity went into the grid, period. Mm -hmm. Then when there's an outage, what happens to all that live electricity going into the lines? Hawaiian so Electric was very, very concerned about well, that. Well, you're the, you're the code guru, mm -hmm. um, anti-islanding, right? So all PV yeah. equipment has to stop, essentially, mm -hmm. um, or disconnect. Um, in the event of a grid outage, yeah. so that you know any line workers, anybody that has to go fix the grid is going to be safe. Mm -hmm. and so the system is shut down. They actually take five minutes to come back online. Those are all code-directed uh, requirements that the, that the equipment has to follow. Mm -hmm. So when you buy a, a battery system now, you've now created a, a microgrid, and I, we kind of like to call it at the home level a nano grid. Mm -hmm. It's a very small grid unto itself. It has a built-in automatic disconnect. So in a grid outage, the system disconnects itself. So, so the line workers are safe. They're safe. There. Yep. And now the whole house is still op in general. Mm -hmm. You can do different systems. We, we tend to focus on systems that will support the entire house. Mm -hmm. You can do a part of the house. You don't have to do the whole house. You could do an emergency panel. Um, but we find that most consumers would prefer to just have the whole thing done. Mm -hmm. and. And there's a number of products now that have, you know, we all, you know, almost everybody's heard of uh, Tesla Powerwall. Yep. Um, there's, there's, uh, that's a, a very popular product that, that we sell, but there's uh, a number of other manufacturers kind of coming into the game too. Um, mm -hmm. Tesla kind of led the way with a, a lower cost product um, and, and good application controls that I think really reached the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of interesting. It's not when you think about the PV industry, we're kind of, you know, we, we haven't had like an Apple or a, you know, a, a yeah, brand yeah. like that in, in our business. And, and so I think it brought a level of consumer awareness that wasn't really common yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The good old Elon Musk yeah. revolutionizing yeah. things. Yeah. And so if I understand it correctly, back in, <clears throat> in the bad old days, applying for storage in a permit, you have to go through the building uh, permitting department <clears throat> it was it took a long time it did yeah but recently we passed the 2017 national electrical code and it has whole chapters on storage yep. and the safe uh, design of the storage batteries and the safe installation of the storage yep. batteries so as i understand it all the applicants like yourself need to do is in essence tell the plan reviewer I'm complying with NEC 2017. And they'll look it over, yep, you are. Boom, here's your permit. Is it that, that I, kind of simple? I, I think for a new product, it's mm -hmm. always a little bit challenging mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, Department of Permitting. Um, we work with them closely and um, we've developed, uh, we, and not, you know, we're not the only ones, other installers too, develop materials and methods permits for specific products. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to get basically an instantaneous permit. Mm -hmm. So so we don't find that we have a lot of delays there. When you're doing something really unique, sometimes you can run into that. And there's other, you know, commercial buildings, they still take usually, you know, a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, but residential permits aren't really a problem for residential mm -hmm. PV and storage. Um, you can usually get them really quickly. Um, and, you know, everything's still there. Like the tax credits are still there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the savings, um, you know, there's uh, in the non-export uh, tariff uh, uh, customer self-supply, um, which came, which is a tariff that came out after net metering closed. You can get utility approval usually in about two weeks, so mm -hmm. it's very quick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that and that's kind of a misperception that some people hang on to from a few years ago that it takes a long time. Yeah. But we're yeah. we've seen now that the products have stabilized. There's enough of them. Uh, and the rules have kind of stabilized. Mm -hmm. We're actually starting to see pretty strong growth. Where yeah. uh, I think DBET said last year, 2017, there was about 750 grid tied batteries installed on Oahu. Mm -hmm. We expect that to be basically triple or quadruple this year. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're moving a lot faster now. And from the safety standpoint, every it takes just one accident to spook everybody. Yeah. And we had the famous uh, Kahuku fire. Do oh, you know enough about that? To I, the, talk, the, the wind tower. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a different kind of battery. Mm -hmm. And and so I mean, like anything, you can put more energy into something than you should. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know that can cause problems. So I would say we're very comfortable with the residential batteries yeah. that we yeah. see out there. One, we haven't seen any problems like that. Um, they have built-in controls that prevent mm -hmm. them from taking too much energy. Um, uh, you know, the, the, that particular system, the the the, the Kahuku battery, was a, an older system mm -hmm. and perhaps wasn't designed right for the yep. amount of energy a turbine can put in. Wind turbines can also, you know, once the wind gets going, mm -hmm. it's hard to slow them down. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's always, you know, you see that. Uh, I think the common thing is you, you know, you'll see the videos of like a, you know, like the Tesla car or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, my, my, you know, because it's new, we focus on it. You know, we don't see a video every day for, you know, every fossil fuel mm -hmm, car mm -hmm. that burned out. Every once in a while, you'll be driving down the freeway and you'll see one, and I'm glad I wasn't in that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think fundamentally, these systems are, they have a lot of safety built in. You, in, you know, you know from, the, from the code, um, you know, that, that uh, they have mm -hmm. to be designed to disconnect, mm -hmm. um, not to overcharge. Um, you know, the Tesla systems, which I'm most familiar with, have a secondary, they sit in a bath. The, the cells are actually about the size of a double-A battery. Mm -hmm. And they're tiny, you know, it's, it's actually kind of stuff we would all be very familiar with. They don't look like that in their, you know, when they're all put together, but um, they sit in a bath of, of uh, coolant so that, you know, even if one went down or one had a problem, then, it, you know, the coolant would essentially keep the others from propagating that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is what the plan checkers are really concerned with, health and safety yep. above everything else. And I think these batteries from your description have been designed for real, real genuine we've got, health We've got over 500 yeah. systems deployed at this point. Some, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, uh, about 20% of those for the state of Hawaii on schools. Mm -hmm. um, haven't had any problems like yeah. that with any of yeah. them. Um, and uh, in fact, you had very few problems at all. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I would, you know, I think they're very safe. Yep. Um, I think those, those we, we heard more about that a few years ago. And I think there's bad. been enough out there um, that uh, people feel pretty comfortable. Yeah, bad, bad news is real news. Good news is, yeah. 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 So on that cheery note, we must bring this to a close. Howard Wig, Code Green. Thank you so much, Josh Powell, CEO of Revolution. Thank you, Howard. It's been a pleasure.